Greetings, church family, and thank you for joining us on these uh, on the service today online. And uh, we're grateful that we're able to gather together like this just to worship God and honor Him and uh, praise Him and also to pray uh, together. We want to especially welcome those of us, or those of you who have joined us for the very first time in this online service. Uh, thank you for being with us. We uh, encourage you, uh, if you'd like to, uh, to go to our church website and on the top right corner there's a mail icon. You can click on that and subscribe to our weekly email that keeps you informed of what's happening in church, our, the messages that are released every Sunday. Uh, it'll just be a way for us to know that you connected with us today on this online service. Also, we want to just remind you of all the uh, free resources that are available uh, on our church website and on the YouTube channel. Uh, please make use of these free resources to keep yourself strengthened and encouraged during this time. We uh, Just another reminder that next Sunday will be the first Sunday of July, the 5th of July. We'd like to usually, uh, the first Sunday of every month, we partake of the Lord's table together. So just a reminder to get the elements ready during the course of the week so that next Sunday, the 5th of July, we will be able to partake of the Lord's table. Now, before we get into the Word of God today, uh, we're going to make our declaration, and then we will take time to be in the Word of God. Good morning, church, and welcome, everyone. Uh, a special welcome to everyone who's visiting us for the first time. Before we get into our declaration, I just want to turn our attention to the authority and dominion that God has given to us. He's called us to rule and to reign as kings. He has called us. What do kings do? They decree things. They establish things in their kingdom. They change things in that kingdom. So as people of God, as children and servants of the Most High God, we have been given authority to decree things within our life, within the world around us and over the powers of darkness. In Luke 10, 19, he says, I have given you authority to trample over snakes and scorpions. Right. And uh, let's believe this as we go into our declaration, because we are overcomers. We are victorious in our life, in our situation, in everything. So get onto your feet, lift up your Bibles high up in the air and say with me, this is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I am saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, triumphant, and prosperous. I am a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of his blessing to many people. I receive his word, I believe his word, and I live by his word. Christ is my master, and to him I am in absolute surrender. I present myself as a new wineskin to receive the new wine and fresh oil being poured out on me. God releases new things and a new work of his spirit in me and through me. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Alicia, for doing that declaration for us. And, you know, it's just a wonderful thing for us to be able to speak uh, the word of God and declare what God has said about us. Today the, is the fourth Sunday of the month. And uh, typically on the fourth Sunday or the last Sunday of the month, we um, call it Supernatural Sunday, where we really uh, minister a very simple message. And then we pray together for God to do wonderful things, supernatural things uh, in our lives. And so that's what we're going to do on the service today. I hope you've been prepared, and I, I just believe that God will minister uh, to each of us uh, as we receive his word and as we pray together at the end of the service. Now, you and I are aware, very much aware, that we are living in uncommon and unprecedented times, just brought about on us unexpectedly, suddenly, by this pandemic that's really, uh, in many ways, crippled many things uh, globally. Now, uh, uh, this is not, obviously, this is not the first pandemic that the world is experiencing. And if you look at the history 
Uh, there have been several epidemics and pandemics that, that you know, the, the, the people have journeyed through. Uh, but this one is, is, is really uh, unusual in many ways, impacting so many nations uh, and is in, is, is in a large, large scale, uh, which in many ways is uh, uh, unprecedented in its impact. Uh, we are experiencing the fallout uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, the economies of the world have been impacted. This means that, you know, it comes down to the very livelihood. The jobs of many, many people uh, have been affected. We also know that there's been a sudden shift uh, to a virtual world. So many of us uh, have been forced to engage uh, using technology and we are in, in a quote unquote virtual world where we interact with people uh, without necessarily coming into personal contact with them uh, except through means of technology. We also uh, see the, you know, many things happening around the world at the same time. There are a lot of political tensions going on uh, around the world, uh, right across our own borders, across India, between India and Nepal, and India and China, and then things that are happening between China and Hong Kong, uh, and several other parts of the world. There is political unrest, and there is also global unrest caused because of other reasons. Uh, uh, the whole struggle for equality, uh, race equality, and, and a struggle against racial injustice, which uh, has gripped, gripped the world in, in, in recent weeks, is again another thing that's happening all at the same time. And so we are seeing a lot of different things impacting uh, us globally and affecting uh, people all around the world. So while we are in all of these things, uh, and, and we're really living in uh, tumultuous times, or we would call it turbulent times, you know, as you and I, uh, you and I as believers must constantly remind us that while all of these things are happening around us, Psalm 31 verse 15 is, is, is so real for each of us and something that you and I must uh, just lay confidence in and, and just trust God uh, during this time. And I just want to read that, Psalm 31, verse 15. Uh, we, we know the scripture. Uh, the psalmist says, My times are in his hands. My, my times, the seasons of my life, are in his hands. But I want to read this out for us from the Passion Translation. I like this. The psalmist says here, and, and, and this is a Passion Translation. It says, my life, my every moment, my destiny, it's all in your hands. And I want us to say that out together. You're right where you are. Maybe you're listening and tuned in and you're all by yourself. I want you to say that. Maybe you're together with your family. I want us to, let's all just say this together. Let's go. My life, my every moment, my destiny, it's all in your hands. Hands. Let's say that one more time together. My life, my every moment, my destiny, it's all in your hands. You know, when you and I uh, are, are assured of this truth that's presented to us in Scripture, that our times, our moments, our destiny uh, is in the hands of God, uh, it is true that we are living in turbulent times. It, we, it is true that there are so many uh, uh, difficult things and difficulties happening around us. And uh, it is true, all of these things, we're not denying all of that. But yet in the midst of all that, we have this confidence that our lives are in his hands. And God is more than able to secure us and, and to see us through uh, this season, uh, this time in our lives. Now, in the message today, I just want to impress on our hearts a one simple truth and it is this that God can cause you and me to be fruitful in famine so that's the word I want to just bring to us and then share with us on and then we're going to pray together uh, along that line being fruitful in famine that God 
can cause you and me to be fruitful even in famine. So I'm using that word famine more as a as a representation, as some form of a typology, uh, representing to us the turbulent conditions around us and uh, the difficult times, the challenges, uh, the uh, unpredictable conditions around us. So I'm using that word famine in that, uh, in that sense. But in the midst of famine, God can cause you and me to be fruitful. So let's just say this together. And say it boldly, say it strong. God causes me to be fruitful in famine. Let's say it together. Speak it over your own life. God causes me to be fruitful in famine. So that even in these difficult times, God is going to cause you and me to be fruitful. I want to share uh, something for us from uh, scripture, and then, you know, as we go along, uh, just point us to, or just remind us of truth in Scripture uh, to encourage our faith and to really bring each one of us into this place where we are assured that because our times are in His hands, because my days, my moments, my present and my future, my destiny is in the hands of God, this great God can cause you and cause me to be fruitful even in the midst of famine. I want to read a, a, a little uh, incident from Genesis, the 26th chapter. So we're going to read that first, and then I just want to share with us simple uh, insights from this chapter, or uh, what I will call as keys that will enable us to be fruitful even in the time of famine. So if you have your Bibles, you can uh, turn there with me, please, to Genesis chapter 26. Uh, we will start reading from verse 1. Genesis 26, verse 1. There was a famine in the land, besides the first famine, which was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I will multiply your descendants, multiply, and I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed." Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac dwelt in Gerar. I'm going to skip a few verses and go down to verse 12. We'll read verses 12 to 14. Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. The man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants, so the Philistines envied him. Now, I am going to do something which I, I usually, uh, I, I don't necessarily always endorse. That is, uh, you know, use an anecdote, use an, a story in the Bible to you know, established theology. Uh, you, uh, you know, the right thing to do really is to build our life on Scripture, on the Word of God. Uh, we don't build our life on other people's experiences. Uh, but we can learn from those experiences as long as those experiences point us to what the Bible states. So we begin by our knowledge of the truth, and then when we look at people's experiences, uh, as long as though their experiences you know, actually match up to the truth, then we can, you know, embrace those experiences. But many times, you know, because we are all human, our life experiences don't necessarily embody truth. Our life experiences don't necessarily embody God's best for our lives. So we don't base theology on people's experiences, even people in the Bible, whether it's Isaac or Abraham or 
Job or others. I mean, we learn from their lives, but our theology is based on the life of Jesus Christ and the teaching of the Word of God. What does God did God speak to us throughout Scripture? And all of these great men and women of God, whether it's in the Bible or people who've lived through time, remember that all these lives of people uh, are frail, uh, they're not perfect, and so we cannot take their life experiences as the basis for our theology. We learn from their life experiences, but our theology must be based on the teaching of Scripture, the truth that is brought out of Scripture. So that's why I love to focus on just teaching the truth. I don't spend too much time on stories and anecdotes and experiences. But what we're going to do today very, very carefully is to take an anecdote, an, an, an illustration, an incident in the life of Isaac, and then learn some things from that, pointing us to biblical truth. And the truth is this, that God can cause you and me to be fruitful even in famine. And we see this embodied here in the life of Isaac. And I want to bring out from this narrative four keys that we just call as keys or four insights on, that will help us be fruitful even in time of famine. In Genesis the 26th chapter, the passage we just read, uh, we begin this chapter in verse 1 by saying that, you know, there was famine all around. And uh, and so, you know, uh, Isaac uh, was, was dwelling in, in, a, you know, in, a, in a place that, and, and he moved up, possibly, uh, this was already in, in the land of Canaan in Israel. So he moved up a little bit towards, uh, 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 that he would have journeyed most likely northwest, he would have journeyed northwest to a place called Gerar, which was not too far from the town of Gaza. Uh, and that was where the Philistines were there. So he moved up there during this time of famine. He moved to Gera. Now, historically, he, he knew that in the time of Abraham, and there was a famine, what Abraham, his father, did was he went down to the Nile. He went down south to Nile, the Nile Delta, the Nile River, uh, and during the time of famine. So he was inclined to do the same thing, that maybe... I should also head down south, get down to the Nile Delta, uh, and uh, I, I will be fine during this time of famine. But God spoke very clearly to uh, Isaac. It says that in verse 2, God spoke to him, and he said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I will tell you. So here's the first key for you and me in the time of famine. If we want to be fruitful in the time of famine, if you and I want to be, uh, you know, to beat the system, to beat what's happening around us, to overcome all of those things and be fruitful in spite of what's happening around us, the first thing is this. We must learn to listen to God. You see, God knows how to cause you to be fruitful even in the time of famine. God knows what you must be doing, what, you know, what business you must get into. God knows what, how you need to redirect your life or rearrange things. God knows what it's going to take for you to be fruitful in the time of famine. God knows where you need to be. He knows what you should be doing. Uh, he knows what will cause you to be fruitful, even though around you things are not conducive for, uh, for success or fruitfulness. Right? So the first key that we see here in, 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 uh, 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 from Isaac's uh, uh, experience is that he, God spoke to him, said, you stay where I'm going to tell you to stay. Don't do what you know others are normally doing. You know, don't go by conventional wisdom. Listen to me. So the beautiful thing for us as New Testament believers is that you and I, every believer, has the privilege of being led by God. The Bible tells us that, as, that we can be led by the Spirit of God. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. So every child of God has this wonderful privilege of being led by the Holy Spirit. And uh, uh, you know, the, Jesus said that when the Holy Spirit comes, this is in John 16, verse 13, he said, the Holy Spirit will teach you, he will guide you, he will show you things to come. So all of us as believers have this wonderful privilege. And so in a time of famine, in times of uh, times, turbulent times like as, such as these, it's important for us to tune in and say, God, 
what do you want me to do? I know there are things that people normally do. It's normal to go down to Egypt, uh, go down to the River Nile, the Nile Delta, so we can be taken care of. I know all of that is the normal thing. But what do you want me to do? What are you telling me to do? Because I know you can help me be fruitful in famine. And I want to be fruitful for your kingdom. I want to be fruitful in my work life. I want to be fruitful professionally. I want to be fruitful in famine. And we're going to show a few scriptures a little later on that tell us that God will cause us to be fruitful in famine. But the key is this. The first key is to listen to God. God knows where you need to be. God knows what you should be doing. God knows what it's going to take for you to be fruitful. Now it's for you and me to listen to God and say, God, please tell me, what do you want me to do to be fruitful? So that's the first key that I want to highlight. The next thing here is, is, is what, what God says in, to Isaac in verse 3. He says, dwell in this land and I will be with you and bless you for to you and your descendants I give all all these lands. So basically what God is telling Isaac is, Isaac, right now, my will for you, my direction for you is to stay right here because this is the land I have for you. So I want to just put this as, as the second key here is don't leave your inheritance. You see, in times of difficulty, in times of, of pressure, our tendency is, so, you know, I'm going to just give up on my dream. I'm just give, going to give up on my destiny. I'm going to give up on what I am pursuing because I don't think it's, I'm going to be able to get there. But God is telling Isaac, Isaac, this is the land I have for you, so stay right here. This is your inheritance. Don't leave your inheritance now. Stay right here. So stay in your inheritance. Now, if I interpret that for you and me in our, in our context, it'll be continue pursuing the call that God has on your life. Continue pursuing the assignment God has given you. Continue doing what God wants you to do. Don't quit on the dream God has put in your heart. Don't quit on the call of God on your life. Don't quit on what God has wants to accomplish through your life just because of the famine, just because of the turbulence around you, just because of the difficulties around you. Don't quit. God is telling Isaac, stay right here because this is the land for you. So that's the second key. If you and I want us to be fruitful, want us want to be fruitful in the time of famine, we must learn to stand our ground, to stay rooted in our call, to stay rooted in, in, our, in, the, in the purpose of God for our lives and not give up. Now, there may be times when God tells us to make changes in the act activities we are doing, in the methods we may be, uh, you know, engaging with. There may be those kinds of changes, but he's not changing your call. He's not saying give up on your call or give up on your dream. You may change, you know, certain ways of getting there, but you're not giving up on that dream that God has put in your life. You're not giving up on the purpose of God. You're not giving up on, on the destiny that God has for you. You're not giving up on your inheritance just because that, you know, God may rearrange a few things. So number two, a second key for us to be fruitful in famine is stay in your inheritance. Stay focused on what God has called you to do. Don't quit on that. Don't quit on your life assignment. Go after that. Maybe how you're going to get there may change, but you're getting there. Maybe the route you take to get there may change, but you're going to go there. You're pursuing that. So don't quit. The third thing, that I want to bring our attention to here in this, in this passage, in this narrative that points us to biblical truth here is again the latter part of verse 3. When God is speaking to Isaac, you know, it's time of famine. Isaac is thinking I should go to Egypt by the river Nile. God says don't go there. Stay right here because this is the land that's given for you and for your descendants. And in the process, God reminds Isaac of the covenant that he has with him. And that's in, in the third verse, in the latter part of the verse 3. Notice what God says. I, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. What is God telling Isaac? I will perform my oath. I will keep 
my covenant, which I have uh, given to Abraham, your father. So here's the third key. Believe in the covenant that God has with you. Why is God, what is God telling Isaac? In the middle of this famine, God is telling him, stay right here, stay in this place where there's famine all around. Stay right here because this is the land for you. But God is assuring Isaac, saying, Isaac, I will keep my covenant with you. I have made a covenant with Abraham, your father, and that covenant is in effect. It is in force in your life, and I will keep my oath. I will keep my covenant. You see, yes, in, in, in Psalm 105, uh, the, the Bible tells us, and I'll just turn there, in Psalm 105, uh, verse 8, uh, the Bible says, He remembers his covenant forever. The word which he commanded for a thousand generations. So God is not a God who forgets his covenant. He remembers his covenant on to a thousand generations. Meaning, in other words, it's, it's just another way of saying God doesn't forget his covenant no matter how much time has elapsed. He never forgets his covenant. And what is his covenant? It says his word. God's word is God's covenant. And that's what Psalm 105 verse 8 says. He remembers his covenant which he commanded to a thousand generations. His word which he has spoken. So the third key here to, in being fruitful in the time of famine is to believe in the covenant that God has made with you. And that's what God is telling Isaac. Isaac, I have made a covenant. I have an oath that I've made with Abraham, your father. And I will keep that covenant. I will perform that oath. I will keep that covenant with you. And I will establish you. In other words, I know there is famine around. But you are in covenant with me. I'm in covenant with you. I will take care of you. You see, you and I must understand that because you and I are in covenant with Almighty God, we are not subject to what happens in the world around us. The our covenant with God makes us different. We see this in the Old Testament. God looked at his people in the Old Testament, his Old Testament covenant people different from those around them. And it is true for you and me today as, as people who are in the new covenant that we have a covenant with God and God's covenant with us is so sure that if we believe it, God will perform his covenant to us even in times of famine. Because God is not constrained by all the things that, that the famine would impose on us or, or on people around us. God is not constrained by it. God is superior. God is much greater than all these things around us. And all he's telling you and me to do is believe my covenant. I will perform my oath. I will keep my covenant with you in the time of famine. And so that's what I want to impress on your heart and mind. Uh, you know, the reason you and I can expect to be fruitful in the time of famine is because we have a covenant with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And we've talked about this earlier this year when we talk about our covenant with God and how through the blood of Jesus Christ, you and I have a powerful covenant with God. It's better than the old covenant it has better promises than the old covenant. And, and, and we must learn to believe in our covenant. You know, our covenant tells us that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. That's Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Our covenant with God, that is his word, tells us that a thousand may fall at our side and ten thousand at our right hand, but it will not come near us. That is Psalm 91, verse 7. That's our covenant because his word is his covenant. Our covenant tells us that in 2 Corinthians 2.14, that God always causes us to triumph in Christ. That means no matter what your circumstance is right now, no matter what your situation is right now, 2 Corinthians 2.14, the word of God says that God will cause you and me to triumph. That means he'll cause you to come out victorious. He'll cause you to come out the winner. How God is going to do it, that's up to him. How he's going to make the way, that's up to him. Whatever power, whatever miracle, whatever it's going to take for, for you to come out as a winner, God will do it. But you must believe 
the covenant that you have with God. You stand before God. You know, some of us, our famine, our difficulty, our challenge may be something very personal. While it is true that all these things are happening around us, maybe your challenge may have to do with your marriage. Maybe your challenge has to do with your children. Maybe your challenge has to do with your finances. Now, for some of us, it could be true uh, that our challenge is with our job, our means of livelihood, uh, or, or whatever. But it, in the midst of all that, we must know we have a covenant with God, and God will perform his covenant in your life. You know, as we progress in this narrative, I want to remind you and me some, of something, that not only do we have a covenant with God through his son, Jesus Christ, but the New Testament also tells us that the blessing of Abraham is upon us, New Testament believers. So whatever we're going to read about God doing for Isaac, which God did because of the covenant that he had with Abraham, you and I can say that's for me too. It's not just for Isaac. It's for me. Why? Because the Bible says, and this is in the third chapter of Galatians, in verse 14, it says, the blessing of Abraham comes upon us, the Gentiles. The same blessing with which God said to Isaac, Isaac, I will take care of you because I have a covenant with your father, Abraham. I've made a covenant and therefore I am, I'm going to bless you. That same blessing is available for you and me through Christ. Galatians 3.14 and Galatians 3.29 says, If we are Christ's, then we are Abraham's seed or Abraham's descendants and heirs according to the promise. In other words, what we see God do for Isaac because of his covenant that he established with Abraham, you and I can say, God, that's for me. Because as far as the New Testament is saying, we are descendants of Abraham, spiritual descendants. And if God will do that for Isaac, he will do it for you and me. So let's just recap the first three things. We have one more point to cover. The first one is this. In time of famine, the first key for us, you and me, to be fruitful is we must learn to listen to God because God knows where, God knows what, God knows how. He wants you to be fruitful. Second, we must don't leave your inheritance. Stay with your destiny. Stay with God's call on your life. Stay with God's assignment. Just because things are difficult, don't give up on your dream. Number three, God, believe God's covenant with you. God has a covenant with you. And all the word that he's given, that's his covenant to you. So believe that. Don't give up on that. That's key. The fourth one is this. In, uh, I'm skipping some of these verses, but that's verses 7 to 11. Uh, it tells us, you know, Isaac, you know, did something wrong. Now, that's again a clear example. That we don't want to follow everything that we see in people's lives. We don't have to follow Isaac when he lied about his wife. So we leave that story aside. We skip down to verse 12. So here he is in Gerar. There's famine all around. What does he do? Verse 12 says, Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. What did Isaac do? He sowed in the land, and he reaped. How much? A hundredfold. And then it continues in verse 13. The man began to prosper, continued prospering, until he became very prosperous, for he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. To put it simply, Isaac was fruitful in the time of famine. But he did something. He sowed in the land. Now that's something uh, when I'm trying to envision in my mind. It's a time of famine. It's, it's probably it's dry all around. I'm not sure exactly what the conditions were. But other than what the scripture tells us, it was famine. It, it must have been dry. Things may not have been very productive. I'm not sure. But Isaac sowed in the land and God blessed him and caused him to be fruitful even in time of famine. So here's the fourth key. Sow and expect to be fruitful. Now by sowing, sowing is an expression of expectation. When you're sowing, when somebody puts seed in the ground, they're expecting 
it's, it, they're expressing an expectation that this seed is going to grow up and it is going to produce something, whatever that seed is. It's going to produce. So there is an expectation. So when you're sowing, you're expressing expectation. I'm expecting something out of this. No farmer is going to go around his field sowing seed and saying, I'm just doing it, you know, because I have nothing else to do. Or I'm just doing it, you know, I'm not expecting anything. That, no farmer does that. Every farmer, when they sow seed, they're expressing expectation. They're expecting harvest. They're expecting fruitfulness. And Isaac sowed in the time of famine. He sowed in the land. And God made him fruitful. What does this mean for you and me? That in the time of famine, things are difficult. You're listening to God. You're holding on to your life assignment. You're holding on to the call of God. You're not giving up. You are believing in the covenant of God. You're believing that God will cause you to be fruitful. You're believing that even the time of famine, God will, will bless you. You're believing in your covenant with God. And now you do what you have to do. You sow. Uh, it means, uh, it, it, if you are a professional, you do your job, do your work. Whatever you're doing, you do it. But you're doing it with the expectation that God will cause you to be fruitful. If God is telling you to do something new, you step up there and you do it. And say, God, I'm going to keep working. I'm going to keep doing this. I'm sowing because I'm expecting you to cause me to be fruitful. So you get, you get to work. You're putting your hands to your work. You're doing what you have to do because you believe that God will make you fruitful. Now, we must understand certain things here. Between your sowing and your harvest of fruitfulness, there is a process. You know, nobody sows a seed today and sees a harvest in two hours or the next day. That doesn't happen. There is a process. The process is that of continuing to water the seed, continuing to nurture, and continuing to protect. So you've, there's a process. The process involves you. You keep watering. You keep nurturing. You keep guarding or protecting. And then you're going to get your harvest. There's a process. And so you and I, as we, we sow with expectation of being fruitful, we're expecting to be fruitful in our time of harvest. We must be willing to go through the process in between your, your sowing and your reaping. In you know, Psalm 126, uh, some of us are familiar with it. Uh, the scriptures tell us here, you know, those who go, uh, let me turn that. Psalm 126, verses 5 and 6. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. So you sow in tears, but you know you're going to reap in joy, and you're willing to go through that process of nurturing, of watering, and protecting your seed, your, your whatever you're doing, because you know you're going to be fruitful in the end. God has promised to bless you, just as he did it for Isaac, he will do it for you. You and I are expecting to be fruitful. In the, in, in the time of famine, you and I are expecting God to cause us to be fruitful uh, in these times. So I just want to read for us here from Psalm uh, 33. Psalm 33, verses 18 and 19. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. It says God's eyes are on you and me. And what will he do? He'll keep us alive in famine. That means even in famine, God will make sure we are provided for. Or Psalm 37, verses 18 and 19. The Lord knows the days of the upright and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. In the days of famine they shall be satisfied. Or one translation says they will have abundance in the days of famine. So here's what I want us to understand. 
God will, can cause you and me to be fruitful in the time of famine. In these times when things around us are difficult, God has a covenant with you and God will work in your life to cause you to be fruitful. But take these four simple keys. Listen to what God wants you to do. Secondly, stay focused on your assignment. Don't give up on your inheritance. Number three, remember or believe in God's covenant with you. Believe that. And number four, sow with expectation of fruitfulness. You do what you have to do. Put your hand to work expecting to be fruitful because God will cause you and me to be fruitful. He will cause us to come out fruitful. Now some of you may be sowing to see things change in your family. Some of us may be sowing to see things change in the lives of our sons and daughters, our children. Some of us may be sowing in some other areas in our life in the time of famine. And I want you to expect to be fruitful. Expect to be fruitful. And we as a church, you know, uh, this pandemic has impacted so many churches. I don't know how many small churches, pastors, are struggling because the congregations are not able to meet and therefore uh, they're unable, you know, to interact with their people and able to receive uh, their uh, support and, and so on. And we don't know the actual impact on the smaller, on small churches and congregations around uh, our country and or maybe possibly around the world. But thank God that for us as a church, we're able to navigate through this time and we're able to go forward through this time, press through the season. But what I want you to know is that we're not just expecting to come out through the season, but we're expecting fruitfulness through this season. That when we come out of this time of, 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 of lockdown and all of that, we're going to come out fruitful. And I'm believing God that when we regather together, we will come out so fruitful. We will see that God will bring upon us greater fruitfulness because God causes us to be fruitful in the time of famine. He will cause us to come out with greater fruitfulness, even as a congregation, even as a body. When we come back together, there will be greater fruitfulness released in us and through us as we've journeyed through this time of famine. I want to close with this verse and then we're going to take a, a, the worship team will lead us in a song and we'll come back and pray. In Isaiah chapter 32, it talks about the work of the Holy Spirit and it talks about, points us to the fact that the Holy Spirit causes fruitfulness. Isaiah 32 and verse 15. The verses prior to this talk about, you know, difficult times, barrenness and so on. And verse 15 says, Until the Spirit is poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is counted as a forest. And as the Holy Spirit comes upon us, and He causes what is barren, what is this wilderness, to become fruitful. So fruitful that it's like a forest. Abundant. And it's the anointing of God. The Holy Spirit. That will cause you and me. To be fruitful. What we're going to do. We're going to take a few moments to worship God. And out of that we're going to come back and pray. And we're going to pray towards this one thing. That God will cause each one of us. To be fruitful. In this time of famine. And through this time of famine. That when we come out, like Isaac, we'll come out as blessed. That God will cause us to increase a hundredfold. And the people look around us and say, that's the Lord's doing. The Bible says the Philistines looked at Isaac and they weed him. They said, like, how could this man come out like this, having gone through this famine? The Philistines became jealous of Isaac. Why? Because God was keeping his covenant with his man. And God is keeping his covenant with you and me. We must believe it. And God can cause us to come out fruitful. Even through this time of famine. 
the anointing, the Spirit of God poured out on us, causes the wilderness to be fruitful, so fruitful that it becomes like a forest. Let that anointing come on you and me, on us as per individuals, on our families, on our children, so that through this time of famine, we will come out fruitful. Let's worship God and we'll come back and pray. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You've never failed me yeah. You never fail me I know the night won't last Your word will come to pass My heart will sing your praise again Jesus, you're still, Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. The promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Never fail me yet.
Let's sing it, church. Put all our faith in Jesus' name alone. Let's declare it. team for leading us in that time of just looking to God. We're going to pray and as we pray I am just believing God that the Holy Spirit will touch you. Like we read in Isaiah 30 to 15. The Holy Spirit being poured out on us will cause the wilderness to be fruitful. It's not the work of a man. It's not the work of some great preacher but it's the work of the Holy Spirit that causes fruitfulness, that causes the desert to rejoice and blossom like the rose, that causes rivers in the desert, that causes the wilderness to be fruitful. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. All we can do is to pray and connect by faith. So let's do that right now. Father, we come to you on the basis of your word. We've seen in your word, God, how because of your covenant with Abraham and with Isaac, that even in a time of famine, you directed Isaac, you guided him, you assured him of your covenant, and you caused him to be fruitful, even in that place. And Father, here we are today, all of us people, wherever we are, in the midst of turbulent times, difficult times. But God, we are in covenant with you through your son, Jesus Christ. And your word is true. You said you will cause us to triumph. You said a thousand may fall at our side and ten thousand at our right hand, but it will not come near us. You said, God, that in the time of famine, we will be satisfied. We will have abundance. And so, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, I pray that the anointing of your Holy Spirit come upon every person listening, watching, joining by faith. Let the anointing of God come upon each one of our lives, our homes, our families, our children, our workplaces, our businesses, everything that concerns us, causing that to become fruitful, oh God. And when we come out of this time, when we come out of the season, may we see a hundredfold fruitfulness in our lives. Because if you caused Isaac to be hundred times fruitful in a time of famine, you can do it again, Father. And I speak a hundredfold fruitfulness, a hundredfold increase over our lives. As we come out of this time of famine, Father, let your prayers be answered. Prayers for families, prayers for children. Prayer, Lord God, for healing, for deliverance. Let this be answered. And Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, let there be increase. 
Let there be a hundredfold fruitfulness released upon every life, home, family, workplace, and business by the power of your Holy Spirit. I mean, thank you for it. Thank you for it. I want you to just agree with me. And you declare before the Lord, God, I thank you. You caused me to be fruitful in the time of famine. You caused me to be a hundred times fruitful, hundred times fruitful in the time of famine. Declare that. I also want to take a moment just to pray for healings. Those of you who may be suffering in your body. I know I haven't preached on that today. But the Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So right where you are, if you call upon the name of Jesus, there is salvation in that name. There is healing in that name. So if you look to Jesus and just call upon that name and as I pray, ex expect healing, expect deliverance. Let's pray together. Father, right now I pray for those who may have tuned in expecting healing, a miracle touch, a healing touch in their bodies. And so right now in the name of Jesus, let the power of God bring healing to their bodies. Let bones be healed. Let vertebrae be healed and discs that have been damaged uh, and between those vertebrae be healed right now in the name of Jesus. Let injuries because of accidents be supernaturally healed right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray, your, your, your word says that the Spirit of God brings recovery of sight to the blind. So let there be healing, even for eye conditions and eye problems right now, in the name of Jesus. Let sight be restored in the name of Jesus. And Father, we just thank you for whatever people are praying to you right now for, in the name of your Son, Jesus. Let healing take place. Because you are the Lord, our healer. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Thank you so much for being with us on the service today. You know, we'd love to hear from you. If you can take a moment uh, to send us an email uh, to testimony at apcw.org to share your testimony what God has done today or in the days to come as we've prayed and you see things happen in your life, whether it's a healing, a miracle, uh, uh, things that take place, send us a testimony. Let us know what the Lord has done for you so we can rejoice with you. And if we are going to share it, we will always be careful to keep your personal identity uh, secure and just share the testimony of what God has done. So we will be, uh, you can be assured of that. So send us a testimony. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Please take a moment to share this message with as many people as you can. You know, the anointing of God is released as the word of God is ministered to. Uh, there may be people around there who really need to know that God can cause them to be fruitful in times of famine. They just need to know that and they need to receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit on their life to turn their situations around. And so you will be blessing them as you share this message with them and say, hey, God can turn, can cause you to be fruitful in your time of famine. So cheer up. So send this message to as many people as you can. Let's bless their lives and let the anointing of God impact them so that they too can be fruitful in the time of of famine. Let's close with a benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the powerful anointing of His Holy Spirit rest upon each of us always in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. See you again.